I call this meeting of the House Housing Finance and Policy Committee to order. Representative Igbaje, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, I have, and I move them. Thank you, Representative Igbaje moves the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Noting a present uh, a quorum is present. Uh, this committee will move on to hearing our first bill of the session. Um, we have House File 12 from Representative Igbaje uh, before us. And Representative Igbaje, I'll move that House File 12 be re-referred to the House Ways and Means Committee, and I understand that you have an amendment. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Representative, can you just briefly describe the amendment? Yes, uh, so the amendment really just adds language to specify that this funding is one-time funding, um, which makes sense as this is going to be a pilot program. All right, then I will call for a vote on the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. All right, Representative Igbaje, please present your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, as we all know and have said in this committee many times, one of the most important assets that a family can have is a home. Unfortunately, the ability to own a home in this state, especially if you are low income or a person of color, can be prohibited by buried barriers. One of those barriers is the ability to save for a down payment especially if you may be the first person in your family to have the opportunity to own a home. And that is the purpose between uh, about House File 12, which is in front of you today. So the program in this bill is aimed at first generation home buyers. And these are people who have not owned a home or maybe they have lost a home to foreclosure. They also don't have parents who may have owned a home or those parents or guardians may have lost a home in foreclosure. By ensuring that these funds go to those who do not have access to generational wealth, we can support families to start on that path. The assistance in this bill, along with home buyer education, are critical tools for opening home ownership to more people, especially across <coughs> communities of color. The pilot program here becomes another accessible tool to move more Minnesotans into home ownership and begin to improve our state's racial home ownership gap. Yes, this program does not solve other issues around home ownership access, but the goal here is to help those who can afford a home mortgage payment, but do not have the resources for a larger down payment. The lack of sufficient down payment assistance is part of the reason why Minnesota continues to have the fifth or sixth largest racial home ownership gap in the country. And should this program be enacted, we could see significant closure in that gap. We know that the disparities are stark in Minnesota and across the country because of laws that were intentionally enacted throughout our history to create barriers to home ownership for BIPOC households. And so solutions to that injustice must be intentional too. This bill is an investment of $176 million for down payment assistance and will support approximately 5,000 first generation home buyers over the next three years. It is expected that a majority of those supported will be BIPOC households. Eligibility also includes low income and middle income individuals as we know that there are a number of renters who have the income to buy a home but may not have enough to secure down payment on their own. The assistance is structured as a five-year forgivable loan that is capped at 10% of the purchase price not to exceed $32,000. The funds will be administered through Midwest Minnesota Community Development Corporation, which is a community development finance institution. MMCDC will then partner with local CDFIs, tribal entities, and nonprofit organizations administering down payment assistance to reserve, originate, and service funds for eligible first-generation homebuyers in their own communities. Finally, should a family need it, the program is also meant to be compatible with first mortgage products that also provide zero interest or alternative financing options. At the end of our presentation. This bill will enact some of the recommendations in the research project on down payment assistance led by Minnesota Realtors and Minnesota Home Ownership Center. And these same organizations would also support efforts to inform Minnesotans about this new product. Supporters of this bill include an advisory group of nonprofits, down payment assistance providers, lenders, and governments, including City of Lakes Community Land Trust, Hennepin County, Midwest Minnesota CDC, NeighborWorks, Home Partners, Summit Mortgage Corporation, Three Rivers Community Action Partnership, Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity, U.S. Bank, and many others. 
Um, and with that, Mr. Chair, I believe we do have some testifiers who can speak to the importance of such a program and the difference it'll make for Minnesotans. I'll invite your testifiers to come up, and I think Representative Petersburg just had one quick question. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And while they're coming up, uh, Representative McApichay, and thank you for that. Um, I know we're going to hear from the president of the company that's going to be uh, implementing this. Uh, could you give us just a little bit of background about that company, uh, why it was picked uh, as the one versus others out there, and uh, why, um, and if there are um, any kind of background information on this particular uh, institution? Yeah. Re go, go ahead, Representative. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative. Um, yeah, we, you know, the advocates behind this sub selected that organization primarily because of its close ties to a lot of community groups around the state. They also have a statewide reach. Um, I think the purpose was to be able to find an organization that can partner with other smaller organizations to be able to get the information out um, in a more, in an easier way to be more accessible to more people. Um, but when the uh, testifier from that organization comes, I think they can speak more to their organization and their track record, as well as some of the other testifiers can speak to the selection process. Thank you. And we have nine testifiers signed up, so um, what I would ask is if we can, we'll get through the testifiers and then do questions, unless there's a, a burning question um, for a testifier, um, but we should have time for, for questions after the testifiers. Up first, we have Paul Egger, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs with the Minnesota Realtors. Mr. Egger, welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Paul Egger, Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota uh, Realtors Association. We're a statewide business trade association with over 22,000 members working with buyers and sellers every day. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 12, and thank you to Representative Baje for bringing the bill forward again this session. Um, I'm testifying today both on behalf of Minnesota Realtors, but also as a member of a diverse coalition of groups that Representative Agbaje mentioned in her testimony. It includes nonprofits, local units of government, businesses, business trade associations, and that has been working together over the past couple of years on this issue. I'd like to provide just a brief overview of where this initiative started. A few years ago, Minnesota Realtors and the Minnesota Home Ownership Center partnered to launch the Minnesota Down Payment Assistance Research Project. We had two goals for that project. One, identify ways we can remove barriers facing home buyers with limited savings. And two, reduce Minnesota's racial home ownership gap. That project led us to commission a report from a group called Rosen Consulting titled Home Ownership in Minnesota, Quantifying the Need for Down Payment Assistance. That report was completed in early 2021. And one of the key findings that reinforced the importance of focusing on down payment assistance was this statement. Quote, although there are numerous roadblocks in the path to home ownership, especially for low and moderate income households and communities of color, the lack of capital for down payment is arguably the most significant financial barrier to home ownership. One common way to overcome this barrier is assistance from family and friends. However, most LMI households and first generation home buyers do not have access to these sources of capital. Out of that partnership, um, out of that work, the partnership expanded to include Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity and the uh, growing list of organizations uh, that are listed in the handout that you have before you that work together on the proposal that became House File 12. House File 12 was designed to better meet the needs of first generation home buyers and represents a new approach for delivering down payment assistance which other testifiers will describe in more detail shortly, and is informed by the experience and expertise of the people and organizations supporting this bill, particularly those who work directly with down payment assistance programs. The handout in your packet provides an overview of the outcomes this legislation was drafted to accomplish, as well as an FAQ that explains some of the unique features of this proposed approach to delivering down payment assistance. I would also like to note, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, that later on your agenda, you'll be hearing from Denise Mazzone, who's one of our members. Denise has extensive experience with down payment assistance and helping those households that this bill is intended to help in greater numbers to become homeowners. And she will speak to the importance of down payment assistance and how impactful that assistance can be. 
Mr. Chair, thank you again for the opportunity to, to testify today in support of House File 12. Thank you, Ms. Tiger. Up next, we have Julie Guggen, President and CEO of Minnesota Home Ownership Center. And up after that, we have Julie Nelmark. Chair Howard, members of the committee, my name is Julie Guggen. I'm the president of the Minnesota Home Ownership Center. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you to Representative Egbaje for introducing House File 12. The center believes that owning a home is the foundation for personal and community success. For close to 30 years, we've worked to educate buyers on the complicated process of owning and sustaining a home. We've carried this work out by partnering with community-based organizations throughout the state to offer unbiased home buyer advisory services. In our role as an intermediary, we also engage in other efforts to drive equitable access to home ownership, like the first generation down payment collaboration that Paul introduced and that is represented in this bill. The members of our working group re represent diverse perspectives and industries and community voices. But we share a common goal, amplifying intentional solutions to break the cycle of racial inequities in home ownership. Too many Minnesotans have been shut out of the dream of home ownership through overtly racist, intentional laws and industry practices. The development of intergenerational wealth was stifled by these practices and the impacts are real for today's generation of buyers. Capital for down payment assistance is a significant barrier for households of color pursuing home ownership. Traditional practices in down payment assistance have fallen short. Minnesota's black home ownership rate peaked in 1950. Since then, the gap between white and black households has more than doubled. Just as laws and industry practices have been enacted to intentionally exclude BIPOC homeowners from home ownership, so too must our approach to reversing these inequities be intentional. House File 12 calls for a profound but realistic investment of $176 million to serve a minimum of 5,000 households over the next three years. The dollar amount available per household is meaningful and reflects the very real increase in home prices and interest rates that, that we are experiencing. Most down payment programs available today simply don't provide enough money. The program would be administered by community development financial institutions, tribal entities, and qualified nonprofits under the leadership of MMCDC, who you'll hear from shortly, all with demonstrated experience in reaching households underserved by traditional financial institutions. <laughs> Administration would be simplified and standardized compared to the more <laughs> traditional down payment programs, making it more accessible, accessible for buyers and their trusted advisors, advisors like real estate professionals. The program can be used anywhere in the state with a variety of approved first mortgage products, empowering consumer choice and minimizing additional systemic challenges that are prevalent in so many DPA programs today. Our approach with its first, general em first generation emphasis is additive, supplementing other solid programs available in Minnesota. I'd like to draw your attention to our growing list of supporters on the handout that we received, that you received. The endorsement of these organizations and the diverse interests they represent demonstrates the ubiquitous call for innovative, responsive change. It is in this spirit that I'm here today to speak in support of House File 12 for funding first generation down payment assistance that is targeted, adequate to meet the need, and accessible to consumers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next, we have Julia Nelmark, President of the Minnesota Mid Midwest Minnesota Community Development Corporation. And after that, we have Roxanne Young Kimball. Ms. Nelmark, welcome. Thank you, Chair Howard, and members of the committee, and Representative Agbaje for introducing this bill. Thank you for giving me the time to introduce you to Midwest Minnesota Community Development Corporation, MMCDC, based in Detroit Lakes. <coughs> I'm Julia Nelmark, the President and CEO of MMCDC. Formed in 1971, MMCDC is a nonprofit certified CDFI, 
Community Development Financial Institution and also a member of NeighborWorks America. We provide commercial and mortgage lending and other services throughout Minnesota. We're a mission-based lender and a provider of affordable housing, both single family and for sale housing and multifamily rental housing. Through our subsidiary White Earth Investment Initiative, a certified native CDFI, we provide home buyer education and financial counseling, plus free tax services at volunteer income tax assistance sites on and around the White Earth Reservation. We currently have loans under management totaling over $200 million for NMTC, new markets, commercial, consumer, and mortgage lending, of which $9 million are mortgage loans, first and second mortgages, and down payment assistance loans. We also sell mortgage loans to two secondary market investors to replenish our lending capital. We utilize a variety of funding sources, private and public, state and federal, and we have robust systems, policies, and procedures in place to monitor and track compliance, compile impact data, and report to funders. Our policies and procedures ensure the safety and security of funds, and staff functions have trained backups in place. We are audited annually and have had clean audits for many years. MMCDC has the experience and the capacity to work with the state of Minnesota through Minnesota Housing to administer this first generation down payment assistance program. We have internally assessed the resource and system needs to administer the program and we would be able to implement it in a very short time frame with existing staff and systems. Housing is such a critical need throughout Minnesota and beyond and MMCDC will dedicate the necessary resources to administer this program effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nelmark. Up next, we have Roxanne Young-Kimball, Manager of Residential and Real Estate Development from the City of Minneapolis. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Howard and members of the Housing Committee. My name is Roxanne Young-Kimball, and I work for the City of Minneapolis. More specifically, I'm the Residential and Real Estate Development Manager within our Community Planning and Economic Development Department. I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the city to testify in support of House File 12. And I worked on the uh, working group that developed the first generation down payment assistance fund concept. I'm also a proud resident of St. Paul and a board member of the Minnesota Homeownership Center. We know that homeownership is critical to housing stability. Homeownership is an important strategy to save for retirement, medical expenses, school, or other un unexpected needs. For most, homeownership has historically been a wealth creation strategy, but the stability homeownership represents for most households is the most critical asset. Unfortunately, homeownership is not accessible to all. Generations of Minnesota residents were shut out of homeownership through discriminatory practices like racial covenants, redlining, and subprime lending. For the home buyers of today whose parents were discriminated against, there is not access to parent support for down payment assistance, which is the primary method that most first time home buyers use to initially access homeownership. The Minnesota legislature has an opportunity to join with the city of Minneapolis and our partners to right these wrongs. Minneapolis has committed over $30 million in the last two years to create 190 affordable homeownership units, provide down payment assistance and support homebuyer counseling, and sustain homeowners through our home improvement programs. Our programs have a 70% rate of service to people of color and over half of the beneficiaries of our programs are black households who experience the highest disparities in home ownership. The first generation home buyers down payment assistance fund in house file 12 <coughs> is a critical complement to the programming Minneapolis already supports. We appreciate the committee for taking up this important piece of legislation and thank Vice Chair Agbaje for her work on this thus far. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Thank you. Up next, we have Temi Aginrandi from Equi the Equity and Engagement Director from Urban Homeworks. Good afternoon. 
afternoon, Chair Howard and members of the committee. My name is Tammy Ogunride and I'm the Equity and Engagement Director at Urban Homeworks. We provide affordable housing in primarily North Minneapolis as well as South Minneapolis and a little bit in St. Paul, offering about 136 units of um, affordable housing. We also provide home ownership pathways opportunities for our residents and the larger community. I'm here in support of House File 12 that Representative Agbaje has put forward. Um, it is clear that the time is now. After serving our residents, we've learned over 60% of our residents um, have a deep desire in becoming homeowners. 35 of our res residents specifically are waiting to take our home ownership classes. In neighborhoods such as New North, Jordan, and Hawthorne, we know that with the 10% down payment assistance that this bill would provide, it would make um, housing affordable for our renters. And if this bill allows a stackable option with this down payment assistance, often the mortgage, monthly mortgage payment would be even cheaper than what the monthly rent is in those neighborhoods. I can't stress enough the importance of owning a home. We know that it is the average wealth builder for the um, American family. So this would allow families to build wealth. This would also create stability for families and the larger communities that they reside in. This bill would greatly advance racial equity in the state of Minnesota, given the fact that this bill would severely help our families of color who have been systemically denied um, through things such as redlining and racial covenants. There are several studies that show the impact that owning a home has to a family's health, uh, students' education, and things as such as that. But lastly, owning a home allows um, family members to have a place to call their own. It helps fight displacement as gentrification grows meaning that the reinvestment that are currently happening in cities and areas such as North Minneapolis, the community members would truthfully and ultimately benefit, unlike right now where the investment leads to landlords increasing rent, thus creating an inability to pay, creating then displacement. I cannot stress the importance of pushing forward House File 12 and know on behalf of our residents in the larger community of North <coughs> and South Minneapolis that this would have great benefit um, both economically, socially, emotionally, and more. I wanna thank you for giving um, myself and my organization the opportunity to testify in support for House File 12. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jason Peterson, Executive Director for NeighborWorks Home Partners. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, good afternoon, Chair Howard, members of the committee. My name is Jason Peterson and I work for NeighborWorks Home Partners. We are a nonprofit CDFI community lender who has been helping Minnesota families buy, fix, and keep their homes for over 40 years. Each year we support approximately 1,000 families in their home ownership journey, the majority of which are represent BIPOC communities. NeighborWorks Home Partners is the primary nonprofit down payment assistance lender here in the Twin Cities. Over the last seven years alone, we provided 1,375 down payment loans, helping 1,375 families buy a home. Again, the majority of which are first generation home buyers. We have seen the need for our, this program grow substantially over the last several years. This is due to a number of reasons including the limited housing inventory, higher mortgage interest rates, and the fact that many of the families we support have not seen their incomes keep pace with inflation. These factors have pushed the dream of home ownership out of reach for so many of our fellow Minnesotans, especially first generation home buyers who do not have access to the down payment assistance necessary to purchase. As you all know, a major challenge we are facing is a lack of housing inventory. I would strongly encourage investments to support an increase in home ownership production during this session, which is sorely needed for a healthy ecosystem. That being said, we have not seen a slowdown in demand for our down payment assistance programs 
as families continue to find homes that they can purchase with the down payment assistance, even in this tight market. In fact, the biggest challenge we see for families right now is the lack of funds to purchase a home. While the housing inventory has been a challenge, the recent increase in interest rates has really limited the buying ability and the potential options for a family to purchase a home while substantially increasing monthly costs. For the average credit profile home buyer, the increase in interest rates has increased their monthly mortgage payments by as much as 50% while reducing their buying ability by approximately $100,000. This need is even more acute for first generation home buyers who do not have the generational wealth to support a purchase of this home. Given the large need in the community, we currently help families layer several sources of funds from various programs to try to get down payment assistance they need to purchase a home. This is often very challenging as funds are often not available for very long and come from various sources. This program in front of you today can really move the needle by providing the sufficient resources needed to support these families in one place um, on, a, uh, on a level basis. Given the fact that Minnesota already has one of the largest racial disparity gaps in home ownership in the country, this will likely only grow, unfortunately, unless we are intentional about these investments. Uh, our down payment program has the proven ability to combat this as over half the families we support over half of the families receiving down payment represent by communities that first generation borrowers and this program is is um, patterned off the program in front of you is patterned off our program and we anticipate uh, similar uh, results in addition to the challenge our organization faces in trying to help families cobble together the funds to purchase a home a very real challenge we face is trying to secure funds to help these families. Down payment programs often come and go and last maybe months or maybe a year or two. Uh, this makes it very challenging for home buyers <coughs> to locate these funds and it makes it very challenging for nonprofits to administer these programs. The funds provided through this pilot would provide an important level of certainty during this pilot period to allow us to demonstrate how effective and efficient and successful this program can be on a long term scale. As with any business, there is also a cost for nonprofits to administer these programs. This program is specifically structured so that there is no cost to the home buyer, allowing them to utilize their funds for other important aspects of the home purchase. You will see there is an administrative fee included to help offset the cost for nonprofits, but that's intentionally in there so that is not passed on to the home buyer. I would also like to uh, quickly talk about our partner, Midwest Minnesota CDC, an exemplary organization that we have worked with for years. Uh, one reason that um, we are very excited to have them be the lead within this is um, they have demonstrated, we have partnered with them in the past on similar programs and they have the demonstrated capacity and knowledge to be able to uh, administer such a program and they have the community connections to get this off the ground on a quick basis. So I'm very confident in their work and their ability as the lead entity within this. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for your time today in discussing this bill, and I would encourage you to support this critical investment into our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Denise Mazone, broker and owner of Mazone Real Estate Group. Welcome. to the committee. Um, so I'm Denise Mazone, Mazone Real Estate Group. I'm a real estate broker. I've been in the business for about 30 years. Um, my main um, clientele is first time home buyers. So down payment assistance is extremely important. Um, it, I can tell you tons and tons of stories about how what we did to make the, the deal work. Even so much as what I call a commission ecumen where I have to give up some of my commission. Sometimes they may be, you know, $1,000 short, whatever, anything to make the deal work, right? Or go back to um, some of the finance, you know, to the loan officer and say, look, can you kick in this? Can you, you know, whatever, we gotta fix these numbers. But um, one of the other things that um, I did, I was the president of Minneapolis Association of Realtors last year, and the one thing that I did um, throughout my term was I did an apology for all the bad and the things that have been done to um, you know people of color, where especially blacks, where we cannot um, you know have this generational wealth. So um, that's um, uh, one thing I think that needed to be done, and you know I'm really um, happy about that, proud of that. Um, 
in, but once again, I want to get back to the, the down payment assistance, which is very, very important. Um, I, I see so many people, we have to get their credit together or um, uh, either they have bad credit or no credit. Uh, and uh, so I team up with uh, most of the time with PPL and they have been absolutely amazing. Also, you'll hear from Trent Bowman. He is one of my partners. Um, he is one of my number one uh, loan officers or well, he was the vice president, but um, he sets, he does the, you know, he will assign one of his people the loans for um, working with these first-time home buyers because it's different. It's not like you just go into the bank saying, you know, I want to come and get a loan. You have people that have no idea how to go and conduct business like that. So it's a lot of hand-holding, which we don't mind doing because it's, it's you know, um, it's near and dear to our heart. Um, I'm a member of NARAB. In NARAB, we, um, it's the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Every third Saturday of the month, we um, will have first-time homebuyer classes. Um, we might have 50 people sign up, 30 people show up. And once again, our work, you know, it becomes um, uh, very important. The first thing we do is, is, you know, go through, check their credit, and get everything in order. Um, and this is with, in partnership with PPL, so that way we can get them ready for home ownership. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm here to speak about the importance of home ownership and also the importance of down payment assistance. It's so needed. Um, I've, I've sat on a couple cohorts. Um, with uh, McKnight Foundation recently and also with the poll ads, which I'm so grateful for because um, everyone knows the importance of having down payment assistance and bridging that gap um, in, in racial disparity and home ownership. I want to thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Tanitha Pearl Warren. And I, she may not have been able to join us. If not, we will move on to Trent Bowman, VP of Community Impact, or the VP Community Impact Manager for Bremer Bank. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members, representative. Um, <coughs> my name is Trent Bowman, and I am the new. VP, Community Impact Manager at Brimmer Bank. So um, down payment assistance is so important to me. I'm a resident or I'm a, I am a uh, North Sider, uh, born and raised in North Minneapolis, went to Minneapolis North High, watched my mother uh, purchase a home, kind of took her a very long time to purchase a home and there weren't these programs that were available, you know, for her, you know, watched her get told no, she got a fast no, um, no opportunities for education, no opportunities to be able to better herself, to be able to be a homeowner. So hence, years later, who would have thought that I would be in this business? So as I got in this business and I became a homeowner and I have the opportunity to teach and counsel potential first time home buyers and one of the biggest challenges that they face is assets or down payment money. See, there's five elements of cost to purchase a home. There's down payment, there's lender fees, there's title fees, there's prepaids, which are your escrows, and then there's the broker administration fee. Now, you'd be surprised on how many first time home buyers don't understand the five elements of purchasing a home. And what's the biggest challenge to these individuals? Money. They may have 2% of the funds, they may have 3%, but what we want to do is be able to get the individuals to be able to have long-term funds, reserves. So this down payment assistance program is so important. We want first-time home buyers, especially in the African-American community, to be able to get a bite of that apple. Now, we've been told so many times, you know, you've got the uh, reparations, the 40 acres in the mill, and all of that stuff, but it never happened. So now there's a reality for us to be able to make change, and the time is now. The time is now to open and create a program that will advance BIPOC or African American home buyers to build that wealth within the family structure. What a wonderful concept. What a wonderful concept for mom and dad to be able to purchase a home and not 
be able to tap out all of their own personal funds so they can have reserves in case something happens. How many times do we talk about that? How many times do we talk about when you purchase a home, you're gonna create new debt? And what is that new debt? Everybody talks about house debt, or they don't talk about house debt, excuse me. And that house debt is that stuff we don't see coming. That's the furnace going out. That's the water softener going out. So to be able to have these uh, potential home buyers be able to keep their reserves or keep their money so they can have funds for these replacements or these uh, things that need to be fixed, once again, I would say, what a wonderful concept. So in conclusion, I would say the time is now, the time is now to put together a program to help potential first-time home buyers, it's well, it's well deserved, it's, it, it's, it's well needed. And I'm just proud to be able to partner with people like Denise Mazzone, PPL, Home Ownership Center, NeighborWorks. We are out here fighting the big fight, but we just need a little help. We just need a little more funds and a little bit more opportunity to build that generational wealth, not just for mom and dad, but for their kids and their kids, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, and uh, let's do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our testifiers that signed up in advance. Is there anyone from the public that would like to, to testify? Go ahead, sir. Thank you for joining us. If you would state your name for the record and we'd welcome your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Howard, Representative, members of the committee. My name is Mark Hughes. I've been rolling around here a long time, serving on some of the committees, testifying. I'm here today because I've been a homeowner for a while and some of these programs were around back then but in a different way under different legal language and things like that. But as I, as I sit here today, uh, my wheels are turned. And that is, we have a choice in this life. If we rent an apartment, a townhouse, something like that, the landlord is probably making money, he's building his equity, but we're not gaining that equity at that point. So we go to try to purchase a first time home and it stops. But we, I support this bill, by the way. And uh, then we get these, these uh, first time loans. But I want people to know something. Whether I'm able-bodied or I'm in a wheelchair, disabled, I can still work. Mm -hmm. And I want that opportunity to buy a home mm -hmm. whenever I so please, whether it be a two bedroom, a four bedroom, <coughs> whatever it is, and I'm willing to sit down, not today, talk to a banker to figure out if there's some kind of ongoing uh, federal loan process where a big government, with a big USA, to, to make it so that we can, you can qualify for a VA loan if you serve in the military. I didn't do that. I, I'm not that talented. I can't do that, but I thank the m millions of Americans that have. But I'm wondering if there's some kind of loan that we can get federally uh, put through so we can have this opportunity instead of, oh, well, just this one time or just has this window that you gotta buy a home or not buy a home. I wanna be able to work and buy a home, which is one of the biggest uh, purchases we'll make in our lifetime at any time I so choose, and I think that could be worked out. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Members, we will go to questions now. I saw Representative Nash on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have a couple of questions, and please, I, these questions are for me to get to the point where I can make a decision, and these are questions, Representative Abbaje, that uh, I think uh, you'll recognize are, are, are uh, fundamental to this bill. Um, so how are you going to make sure that this is also administered to people in the outstate? Because the, the inequity uh, that you've talked about for home ownership is not just for the metro area, but how, how does that get uh, handled fairly? Representative Baje. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Nash. That's a great question. Um, so the way that this program is structured is really to make sure that we are addressing um, 
the home ownership needs across the state. Um, I think as you heard from MMCDC, you know, they're based out of Detroit Lakes. They have connections with tribal nations. They also have connections in smaller rural areas across the state of Minnesota. And so I, the expectation is that they will be reaching out throughout the general area. Um, you know, we are also taking into consideration the uh, income eligibility, which uh, in the bill, it states it's 100% area median income or lower. So we are mindful that in the metro area, that's up to $118,000, but in areas like Lake County or Duluth or even Kuchichin County, it's about $83,000. So we're working with different um, communities to make sure that we are addressing the specific needs that they have. Representative Nash. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and to that, uh, uh, Representative Agbaje, you've got a $32,000 cap on, on the amount that can be granted. So doing the math, and for those that have ever bought a house, um, it's, it, it is an expensive endeavor, but so to avoid private mortgage insurance, you, tr you should traditionally put 20% down. So 20% out of 32,000 is $180,000 or $160,000 house, right? Um, is that what you're aiming for here? Or how do you avoid getting somebody this $32,000 grant and then all of a sudden now they're hit with a PMI uh, insurance payment on top of their mortgage payment that they're gonna be making moving forward? Have you gotten to that point? Have you thought through that? Because uh, I'm, I'm really curious because I want to want to be able to make an informed decision. Representative Baje. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. Yeah, I believe that those conversations are being had with um, the home ownership groups that were here today. If any of them wants to come up and add additional context, that's fine. Um, but yes, I mean we are looking at you know hopefully secure you know securing home prices that are at the lower end if possible. But we also know that because of the rates that have gone up because of building costs, inflation costs, all sorts of things, you know, we are looking to make sure that we can provide the most amount of down payment assistance that we can. We're also interested in layering this program with other down payment assistance programs to support that. Um, I've had conversations with Minnesota Housing to see if that's a possibility. I think, you know, we're still in, in negotiations there, but um, as you heard from one of the testifiers, I think from NeighborWorks, you know, they're also looking at ways that they can lower, uh, layer this program with other programs that they have too. Representative Nash. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Bajay, is there, is there any questionnaire or scrutiny that's being uh, gone through to look at the liquidity of folks? I think your last or next to last testifier said, look, things are gonna break, you know, so you're in the middle of summer. If you've ever had your air conditioner break, you go on this long tirade of about 10 minutes worth of curse words and you throw a few things and then you write a check, right? Um, ha have you looked at how that's going to work because, or do you, or do you inspect the home to say, no, you shouldn't buy this because your air conditioner is super sketchy or your furnace is held together with wire because those things are, are a practical reality of home ownership. And I'm just trying to figure out how, how is that being addressed? Representative Bajay. Thank you, Chair Howard and Representative Nash. Yes. I mean, those are all going to be in the process of someone who qualifies for this program. So they will look at their finances. They will go through the home buyer uh, education training. They will go through to make sure that they qualify for these, uh, you know, first mortgage uh, products that, that would accept this down payment assistance. And so all of those things would still be vetted with the home buyer. They would still go through the normal process of inspecting their home, making sure that it's something that's not going to fall down around them and cause them more trouble than it's worth. So those are all still pieces of the program. We're not, you know, the goal is to send people out with a little bit of support. Say they, you know, they found their home, it's something they want to purchase, but what they're looking for is that additional assistance for that capital payment. But, you know, the MMCDC that we're working with, all of the other partners, they are very mindful to make sure that, you know, people don't get themselves into more trouble than necessary. And Anything else, Representative Nash? Last question, Mr. Chair. Um, so we've heard from two of your test fires and we've heard from a lot of folks that inventory is really hard. What happens if someone receives the grant and there's, they, they can't find the house? Um, because it is, it is tough. I mean, houses are going on in the market uh, for nanoseconds at times, right? Or they sell before they even hit the market. So scenario, a person gets one of these and then they, they don't find a house, they don't find a house, they don't find a house. How long are they allowed to have that grant be held on their behalf before they are, are told, hey, look, you know, we've got 25 other people behind you. We haven't been able to find a house for you, so we're going to move on to possibly somebody else. Has, is that something you're talking about? 
Representative Igbaje. Thank you, Chair Howard, and thank you, Representative Nash. That is a great question. I'll actually probably turn it to one of my testifiers if they can, if they have more specifics. But I will just say, oh, good. Um, <laughs> um, but I will just say that you know I think you know the purpose of this is really to work with people who are prepared to buy a home, are ready to buy that home, and this is kind of the, the last step that they need. But I'll uh, turn it to my testifier to to add some more context. Yeah, Mr. Peterson. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair Howard. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, so. Um, this program is structured as a, a five-year forgivable loan. And so really the intention of this product is to help folks build equity. Um, and so to answer an earlier question, the idea is when somebody then purchases a home, they do have equity as they stay over time. Um, to answer your specific question here, there is a reservation process in place. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are one of the primary down payment assistance providers. We currently administer approximately seven programs. Most of these programs do not allow a reservation of funds. Most of the programs now are structured. You have to find a home and you have to have a first mortgage in place and then you come to us with a down payment assistance. This poses a, a, a really large barrier for folks because in a competitive market, as you mentioned, with several offers, um, uh, an unknown down payment assistance source is usually not the strongest offer. So how we've structured this program is there is a reservation period. So folks will have a reservations of funds and it will be a commitment letter, just like a pre-approval for your first mortgage. So when you go out and you shop for a home, you'll have a pre-approval for um, your first mortgage and a pre-approval for this program. So you will have a more competitive offer. Um, we have a reservation. So we have um, recently run um, a large down payment program. I helped 426 families with a similar reservation period. Um, and we're structuring it off of that. And so we, we will have that system set up. It's going to be um, likely a 90-day reservation period. And then if they have a, have a property in place, they can have another 90 days to close. There is extensions we have in place for that, but there will be policies and procedures all around that. So we can ensure funds are um, not held up by anybody, but people are able to make competitive offers because they have that pre-approval in place. Follow-up comment, Mr. Nash? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, I'll just comment and not ask another question. Representative Bagje, I, I would like to work with you on this. I have a lot of questions. There, I mean, there's a, the devil is in the detail, particularly when you're buying a home. Uh, and you've, you've all heard me, you've heard me talk about the importance of that. And I want to make sure that if we're doing this, that we, we stick the landing. Um, I think that there are still a ton of questions that I have. I'm sure some of our members will as well. Um, so I hope that we could maybe sit down. Um, I, I do have, oh, she's not here. I, I have a... <coughs> A meeting with Representative Hassan. I would love to have a meeting with you on how does how does this work, um, because I, I I do want to know more about the, the granular details. Uh, I know that some of you uh, have experienced it. May not always appreciate my granular viewpoint on things, but I, I do think that that's an important issue. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Norris. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Howard, and um, this is obviously a much needed bill, uh, and we want to get the money out to people, make sure that we can get 5,000 new first-time home buyers here in Minnesota. Um, but as Representative Nash mentioned, Mr. Peterson mentioned, and we've talked about in the committee, inventory is a big challenge. And so but to kind of help anchor some of the work that the committee is going to do down the road this session, I'm wondering, Mr. Peterson or maybe Ms. Mazzone, if you could help, you know, give us a picture of kind of what's the ballpark range that we need to be looking at for a, a price range for what type of house somebody in this program is going to be able to afford and I know it will probably vary some by geography in the state but kind of help us paint the picture for us of what we need to be targeting in terms of making sure there's inventory available throughout the state. Mr. Peterson do you want to take that one? So we have structured this program, the 320, so we structured the program, um, so to answer an earlier question also, this program isn't intended to get families out of private mortgage insurance. So we understand this isn't likely gonna get you to the 20% and it's actually structured for a 10% limit. Um, the goal really is to get folks into home ownership so they can build that wealth. The reason that we set that, um, that, that number at three, uh, $32,000 is the average home price right now is $320,000. So we're looking at 20% of the average home price across Minnesota. Understanding greater Minnesota is likely has, uh, most often has um, less expensive inventory, but wanting to ensure that we have that available for all folks. Um, in 
the programs that we currently run this past year, our average, um, we, we averaged about twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in our down payment programs, and we had to cobble, like, cobble that together through several sources. The average purchase price for one of those homes was about $280,000. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, housing in inventory really is a challenge, and those, there are several other really important bills this session to help build that out. But there are properties out there, transactions are still occurring. The single biggest barrier, as mentioned by my fellow test cards, as well as those funds available at the time to purchase. Um, and so if something goes wrong, we don't want to have folks spend everything down. Then the forgivable nature of this also helps that. Um, but then this amount will really make the difference and move that needle. And then I just will add on the reservation aspect of this <coughs> makes folks competitive because that's the biggest challenge in a tight housing market is you get multiple offers. And if you don't have that pre approval, it's very hard. This sets that pre approval in place so you have a competitive offer you can get. Follow up, Representative Norris. Yeah, I think, thank you, Mr. Or Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Peterson. I think that's just real helpful as we try to fit the, the puzzle pieces together in, in building this housing ecosystem here in the state to have a sense of kind of what we need to be targeting to make sure these first time home buyers can take advantage of this program and others. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. I'm not sure which one here. Maybe I'll use this one closer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, basically two questions. One was, um, how did you come up with the the dollar amount, the $176 million for that, uh, because I, I'm just curious as to if that's just a random number or if you had some plans on onto, the, onto how many people you're going to help, et cetera. Representative Bajé. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, yes, so this number kind of came together based on, you know, the amount of people that is expected to help the amount of resources that might go out based on kind of those needs um, across the state, knowing as uh, Mr. Peterson just said that the prices will kind of vary across the state. And so, and then um, this number also changed from the bill that we had last session um, to accommodate for higher uh, increases in prices. So that's how we came up with 176 million. I don't know if you have more context to that or not. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the question. Um, so we are seeking to serve um, 5,000 families with this. Um, and so um, with uh, $32,000, um, and then we do have, as I mentioned earlier, administrative costs built into this. As a testifier mentioned earlier, um, when first generation buyers don't have a lot of money, we want them to keep their reserves in place. So we have built in the administrative costs as well. So the 176 million is um, going to be that $32,000 price point plus the admin to serve 5,000 families. Yep. Representative Petersburg. Yeah, thank you. I have just two follow-up co questions on that regard. So, um, Chair Howard, maybe you you might know this uh, too. Do we have a preliminary idea of how what kind of budget that this committee is going to have yet, in order to know whether or not this fits within it yet? Representative Petersburg, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I hope it's a lot. Um, uh, so, but t TBD. Okay. All right. Thanks. The final question, just as in regards to a, a comment that I think Mr. Bowman made, which was that this bill was really going to help for the equity of the BIPOC community. And, but I'm, I'm not sure that I didn't see anything in this bill that said it was targeted only for the BIPOC community. A am I wrong there? Or is this not something that's available to anybody that fits within those parameters? Representative Egbaje. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Petersburg. Yeah, that's, you know, it's a great question. So the way that this program is structured is really to get at that low income, middle income families. What we do know in the state of Minnesota based on research that's been done is that the majority of those people are members of the BIPOC community. So it tends to be African American, Lat Latino, Native American, Asian American. Um, we are expecting that the, the majority of the uh, users of this program will identify as BIPOC or part of those communities. It will probably be tar it will be targeted to those communities to make sure that they have access to this information and education about this program, and so uh, so what we see when you when you target it like this is you know we want to make it open to everyone who qualifies, but we also want to make sure that it's being targeted and advertised in the communities that have traditionally been underserved when programs like these are available. Follow up, Representative Petersburg. Just just that I, I think what I heard you say is that this is open to everybody and it's just not limited to one particular group. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Chair Howard, uh, Representative Abadje. Uh, I like the concept of this bill. We need to help those. But there's some problems with it that I've found so far. 
One is I'm concerned with the stacking that we might lose some federal money. I, I don't know about enough about those programs if st stacking is allowed in them. Uh, it's something that needs to be looked into. We don't have to do that now, but it, we need to look into it to make sure that uh, we don't lose federal funds and actually end up doing more harm than good. Uh, it's another issue that I have <clears throat> is going through this. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is for your income and in buying a home, you take your income and you times it by three and that's the max you should go for the value of a home you buy. And unfortunately, this bill is just for the individual. It doesn't include household income. So now you've cut that buying power in half. The median income in Minneapolis is about 35,000. Household income is 70,000. 70, and those guys, those come right from the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the government. Now if you do 70,000 times that by three, when using the household income, that's 210,000. Yesterday on Zillow, there was only 98 homes in the Twin City metropolitan area, seven, seven county metro area, that were listed below 250,000. So to get below that uh, 210 that you need for the max that uh, the median could buy, We'll probably have 50 houses in the entire seven county metro area. But because of the way your bill is written, so we need to change that to household income instead of individual income. Because now with going individual, now you're down to 35,000, $110,000 home. And I doubt there's one that's even on Zillow or even available in the seven county metro area. You go to condominiums, but the average cost of a condominium, a condominium is still 270000 in the uh, Twin City area. That's well above the $110,000 cap a person should buy a home with if they're with our medium income. I want to make this work, and I want to get everybody into a home and not be renting. They should have a home with their home ownership, there's pride. And that makes them a better person. So I think we can, I'd like you to work with Representative Nash. He has good understanding of that. That also worked with uh, Representative Dosseth, who's actually a real estate agent and understands these things that go on and see if we can make this bill so we can actually get it to work because I think it's a good bill to do, but it just needs a lot of work. Representative Badger, do you have a, a co comment or? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Johnson. I uh, thank you for your for, for your questions and comments and, and concern. I mean, I think as we've heard from a number of testifiers, yeah, it is a concern that there is an inventory issue in the state of Minnesota. We do want to fix that. I think we will be hearing a number of bills that will begin to address that issue. Uh, the purpose of the bill in front of us today is really to support those who have had the opportunity to work with realtors, work with banks, and you know, find a home that they can purchase that is within their uh, income limits that they have gotten pre-approval for, that they can get that first mortgage for. And we want to make sure that we're supporting them in that process to make sure that they can purchase that home. So that's what we've done. Um, you know, to your comments about individual income versus household income, the bill actually does discuss uh, household income, and that's the eligibility requirement that they will be using uh, for this program. Um, and finally, I mean, I think, you know, all of us, no matter where we live, um, are, are great individuals that are building our families and living our lives and hopefully can thrive in Minnesota. And I think that this is a bill that can continue to advance the goal of home ownership for people that desire it. Um, I think some people don't want to be homeowners, but I don't think that makes them any less of a Minnesotan than uh, those that do. But for those that do desire home ownership, we are here today to provide a tool and an opportunity uh, for them to pursue it. And I look forward, um, Mr. Chair, if you'll allow me, I look forward to working with Representative Nash. I really do want to hear your perspective and um, address some of these concerns and figuring out ways that we can ensure that this um, program is, is going to work effectively because the goal at the end of the day is to make sure that we're helping as many people as possible. So. 
Representative Myers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative, uh, for bringing this bill. Uh, also want to thank all the testifiers for stepping forward. Uh, Mr. Peterson, you know, when you answered, I believe it was Representative Nash's question, it kind of, I'd like to hear the detail that you were going into. Um, you know, I really do like the framework of this bill, and I'm, you know, a little bit interested to, I'll ask the question, it's a little bit of a crystal ball, but, um, you know, in the information provided, it talked about eligibility up till, you know, 2026. Um, do you expect that to be fulfilled before, or you know, I'm wondering how you came up with that time frame, if there needs to be more time? Representative McBadge. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Representative Myers. Just to clarify, you're asking um, why the pilot program ends after three years? Or is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we're looking at this program really as, as, a, as a way to see to make sure that we're collecting the appropriate data, finding out what works, what doesn't work, to be able to go back to understand what's the best way to ensure that these funds get out in a timely fashion to the right, to the groups that we actually want to target, that we're making the impact that we want it to make. So the purpose is, is to start off as a pilot rather than trying to start off building a whole brand new program that we don't really have any data for. So uh, there's also a reporting requirement in this bill. And yep. so we're looking to that to make sure that as those reports come in over the three year pilot, that we understand where we may need to tweak in the event that we decide to continue to move forward. Representative Myers. Yep, one more question. Um, you know, and I, and I did see that reporting requirement and you know, we all know how important data is to make sure that we're making you know, good decisions. Um, you know, I'd be interested to see if you would you know, consider maybe um, you know, putting in there what lenders are helping participate in this so we can see you know, which lenders are you know, really willing to step up and help. Mm -hmm. Comment, Representative Kabadje? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Myers. I think that's a good idea. We can take, continue to take a look at that po going forward, uh, seeing how, you know, what things in statute need to be laid into the report. So. Thank you. Representative Datsa. Thank you, Representative, or, uh, Chair Howard and uh, Representative Abadje. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for bringing this bill to the table. I can see a need for all of uh, Minnesota, so I congratulate you for bringing this uh, to the table here. We look forward to working and moving forward with, with you. I can see that this is in the best interest of all of Minnesotans uh, looking to get into the home market, and uh, there is a need, so thank you. And I saw the representative Nash found his way back on the list. You knew I would be. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rep representative Baje, in your bill on uh, line 2.26, uh, you talk about that the administrative costs should not exceed 3,200 per loan. So it's effectively 10% of the overall grant. Um, I, I do some volunteering and work in the not-for-profit world. It seems awfully high from a grant administration perspective. I don't know what the cost of, of back office loan processing is. Um, that, that's $16 million that's being peeled off to do that. Uh, and I'm just wondering, is, is that, is that industry standard? Is that a, a swag? Is that a, how, how did you arrive at at that number of, of not to exceed because a $16, $16 million grant administration, um, that's when the number becomes eye popping, right? If, it, if you say, oh, it's $3,200 per loan and then you, you do the math, it, 16 million is suddenly a lot. So if we could maybe address that. Representative McBadje. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nash. I'll actually turn it to Mr. Peterson if he has more details. Yes, I, uh, thank you for the question. I can I'll respond to that. So um, that, so I want to answer this in a couple of parts. So the administration actually, so that administrative fee actually covers really three separate costs. So you're going to have the cost um, of administering the loan pool from MMCDC. So as you see um, within this agreement, this is um, not a program that's intended to fall under Minnesota Housing, who generally bears the cost of administering some of these programs. The administration costs, the custody of the dollars, the reporting all of that will be borne by MMCDC. So there's that cost. And then there's the loan origination costs. And so that's the cost that um, I'm most knowledgeable about. And so that those costs that we've set here are in line with the cost that it costs an organization such as ours to provide a down payment. Loan. So our organization is a nonprofit with 20 staff and we have the same licensing requirements as a bank lender does. And so we have licensed loan officers on staff um, and we have many other licensing requirements. And so that, that cost goes into that. And then the third cost of this will be loan servicing. 
So these loans are gonna be serviced over a five year period. There will be um, payoffs that will occur that will go back into the pool. Um, there will be mortgages that need to be filed. There are gonna be mortgages that are gonna need to be satisfied. Um, and so there are gonna be a number of costs that go into this piece um, that roll up to that $3,200, which is kind of the amount. Um, the other thing I would like to add, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is no cost. This, so the way this is created, there is no cost to the home buyer for this. So that is a big piece to this. So if you, yes, you can go and you can get a first mortgage and you look in the first mortgage, origination fee might be one, one and a half, two percent. Yes, that's much less than 10 percent. As was mentioned by a fellow testifier, there's a lot of other fees rolled in there and then there's a lot of other costs. We are not asking the home buyer to bear any of these costs. So that's gonna be an important piece to this. So they, the dollars that they have, that they were able to accrue, they can use if their furnace goes out, if something else happens, they don't need to use these on these. And this is intended as a wealth building opportunity. So not only is it forgivable over five years so they can build their generational wealth, but there are no fees for them back. But now more information can certainly be provided and we, we've broken down um, our costs um, as a nonprofit um, and those are the real costs that we brought into this. And so Representative Johnson had a question as well. Yeah. Chair Howard to the testifier. Um, generally we usually cap the administration part of the loan to two, three percent. Um, you, you divided it up and you said you found out, you know how much the uh, cost is for, to do this just on the administrative side. What percentage of that, uh, of the loan would be just for that part of it? Just for the origination part? Hey, Mr. Peterson. You, you administer the loan process, not the, or the grant process, not the loans and all that other stuff, just the administration part of the, of the grant. Mr. Peterson. Yes, uh, that is a good question. Um, that's gonna be approximately uh, a third of that cost. And any, if with, I don't see other questions, I'll give Representative Egbaje the, the last word on her bill before we take a vote. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee for the engaging discussion. Um, you know, I know that all of us are here in housing because we really see the importance of it. I think many of us also see the strong importance of home ownership and making sure that more people can get into home ownership should they desire it. Um, I look forward to future conversations with members and as well as with the advocates to make sure that this bill is as strong as it can be. And I just appreciate your support today uh, for moving it forward. Thank you. Thank you for bringing a really important bill forward. And I will now move that House File 12 as amended be re-referred re to the House Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries and it's on its way. Members, next week uh, we have a, an extra meeting. We're gonna have a joint meeting with Capital Investment on Monday uh, to talk about capital investment and housing. Uh, and we'll have bills up in committee as well. Uh, so look to your emails for more information on that. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. Great.